brought my phone in case I take a picture of you guys at the end. Not because I'm insane and have to walk around with a phone. That would be awful. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, just a little bit about the audience. We have acting students, filmmaking, editors. We have fashion students. We have some cinema studies students, and they run the range of a, a number of universities and colleges uh, from the area. So just so you know, today we are going to do, it's going to be truncated, it's going to be a little over an hour of um, some clips, uh, just a few of them of her um, expansive career, and some conversation on stage, and then we will quickly open it up uh, to you so that you can ask her some questions. So with that in mind, kind of delving right in, you mentioned something yesterday in your raw, amazingly hilarious in conversation with last night. It was really good. I'll try to repeat that. I don't know it. At this hour, what is no it? Pressure, no pressure, no uh, pressure. You mentioned that you sometimes thought of directors as teachers, and I thought that was a really great, great way of thinking about any time anyone's working in a collaborative way. There are some people that are great mentors. There are some people for however they, um, they affect you in the certain stage you are in your career or your life. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you meant by some directors or teachers? Well, I'm not academically trained in the sense, well, I'm just not. Um, uh, I, I did go to a, a cold reading workshop when I was 11. Um, I told this story last night, but I went to three classes. It was this lovely woman who um, had taught just a handful of kids in her backyard and we would read scenes, and I guess I developed a sense of um, improvisation. And But basically I learned the one thing for auditions is when you're given material in five minutes to look at the line, make it your own, and say it, to commit to it. I mean, that is an art in, it, in and of itself. Anyway, she died the third time I went. It's, it's funny and tragic, funny now, but at the time I was like, I'm not going to class anymore, that's so sad. I really liked her. But um, so my uh, training is in plays and music. I always, it, for me, it was always all of it. Um, I took piano. I always did musicals as a kid and, and, um, and like that. And so later, when I started working professionally, I mean, you hear a lot of this in life is like, what do you take from this experience? What, what is this teaching you? What are you supposed to learn? You know, those questions. And I honestly look at each director as a, as a teacher because I've learned so many things from different, uh, different things from different ones. Um, namely, the beginning is Scorsese, but there's even teachers before that. Um, that I've all had, had I've developed um, a sense of my own artistic core through these uh, different experiences. I can illuminate on yeah. illuminate. Maybe we'll start with the first clip, which is Cape Fear, and then you can talk about um, Scorsese working with Scorsese. Okay. So kind of returning back to this idea of Scorsese being a great teacher, um, did he help you with what then you became known as having naturalistic kind of acting? Did he encourage that or was that something later? He He absolutely encouraged it. That's what was amazing is he allowed it. Um, there's so many things I could say about this scene and the journey. Because right before this, I had done these really horrible sitcoms in like 1989. So I had done sitcoms, that's all there was offered to a, a young person in the acting arena. And when I had blonde hair, I was the pretty airhead. And when I had brown hair, I was the sarcastic, uh, you know, moody daughter. So that's as <laughs> that's as silly as it was, uh, but it, here's what's funny is so I was doing this sitcom and they they actually hired an acting teacher for me to try to get me to conform. So all those things that Scorsese later validated, they were trying to tear it down. You know, they were so they'd hire an acting teacher to try to get me. You know, literally, who would go smile? You know to try to get me to have more energy and to not fidget, to stand up straight and be like, gee, dad, I don't understand, you know, and deliver 
to try to get me to do that stuff because that's what was going on on TV at the time. And so I, thank goodness, fought. But literally at 16, I was like, I don't know if this acting thing is for me. This is horrible. I don't, I don't want anything to do with it. So then I did this movie of the week with Brad Pitt that allowed us both at the same time in our careers to, to do drama. It was very melodramatic based on a true story, but it was I I instrumental in getting the attention of Scorsese and De Niro. And then doing this movie, what he did and what's so brilliant about Scorsese as a director, and if there's directors in here, is he learned how each actor needs to, to work. So Jessica Lange was very uh, theater trained, and I, I remember he pulled me aside and he was like, I want you to make up some stuff off camera. Just try to shock her. Because he was trying to break her technique and get something different than what she was um, giving, because she was very precise. And then De Niro, he would just work with, because De Niro does a lot of uh, back story, and um, he, he, Scorsese told me one time, we were like going over a scene, it, and he goes, oh, I just came for Bob's trailer. He had an organ player, and they were singing in tongues. <laughs> so, because his character would, got found religion in jail, so, and he speaks in tongues at the end of the movie. So that's what De Niro's thing was. And so me, how he handled me was to just allow me, he left me alone a lot, basically, and, and nurtured my instincts was, and it was one of, it's the most profound uh, thing you could do for an artist is uh, um, validate and nurture um, their instincts and their own uh, point of view. Uh, so that scene, that scene, you know, we would talk about it a little bit in rehearsal, but um, unlike Nick Nolte and Jessica Lange, I didn't know how to articulate anything at that time. I didn't know how to articulate my ideas or my process. I was very young and introverted, but not to be confused with, I did know what I was doing. Like, unlike a lot of people thought, I would, oh, Scorsese found this ingenue in, the, in middle America or something. I was dating a 25 year old. I was living on my own. I was, you know, I, ha I was not that girl. Yeah. Um, but I did understand all the nuance and, and all that color uh, that you, the shading uh, that you see. Um, but I have so many funny stories about that scene. So he, it, what was brilliant, and it's a luxury because it doesn't happen very much on movies, but it, Scorsese used two cameras. He, had, he knew enough to, to go, okay, I'm going to capture. De Niro and Little Lewis with two cameras and so that we didn't do many takes because normally you shoot the, the one actor and then we've, I know what he's gonna do and then we shoot my side. But he captured all this spontaneity and reaction in the moment. And um, so we only did a handful of takes and that, that thumb part, that was the first time. We only did that twice and that was the first reaction. And um, all he told me, I knew in the script, De Niro, the bad guy, comes to her and kisses her. Um, and then, so he just said, he, he, you know, on that part, he, he's going to do something. He's going to do something. It, just go with it. This is my Scorsese impression. He was like, just, 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 you know, just go with it. It's, so I was like, what? What is this? What is he going to do? I don't know. Um, but in that part, that that's the girl. That's not me going, you know, that's her. Because it's all about this. You know, she, all, if you see in my eyes, and I, it, it's amazing to look back at your work and to learn what it is you were doing. Because I was just all instincts. And um, not to get, be confused with... Uh, 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 an analytical point of view because I did break down scenes and sort of understand a, a lot of the text but um, but when I look at the expression she's literally it's just about pleasing someone who's paying attention to her and afterward when I did all these interviews they would analyze it and say wow you captured the sexual the burgeoning sexuality and the precocious blah 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 I wasn't thinking all that I was literally just a, a young girl who's not listened to by her parents, she doesn't know this guy's a bad guy. That was the other thing, is a lot of people in the movie saw he b bites the cheek off and rapes a girl. I don't fucking know that. She doesn't know that. 
she's just like, oh, an acting teacher who smokes pot and who's talking to me and thinks I'm cool. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe a little more than that, but. I, it's great that you mentioned actually the um, her physical composure and the way she's reacting because I wanted to show the next clip of Husbands and Wives because that character's, the way she's standing and carrying herself, it's you know a year after Cape Fear, so this idea of you being this ingenue, what did they then think? Then you all of a sudden were like a woman of the world because you then knew how to be this strong character instead of, you know, you're an actor. I was always, the, is, uh, the other thing is that I think a lot of people, you're always reacting to your past work. So I, I'm always, I just always want to do something I haven't done before and that was re always really important to me. Um, even though I'm not, I, you're sort of, it's the luck of the draw, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm an actor, so I'm on the, uh, the where I'm on the other end of someone hiring me. One thing I wanted to say about Cape Fear was the creation of character. This was, um, because I've gone to a lot of classes and my friends' uh, acting classes, and I find that the language, you know, I do, I do a lot of the things that they teach. There's a reason these things are known, but, uh, like characterization, I find that before a job, I just try to be really open to my environment and really wide-eyed and, and look and try to see your character in, your, in the environment or you look in your past experience and go, have I met this person? And you can pull from that. And I'm very behavior oriented because in early on and even to this day, I don't really have the luxury of a lot of text so it's always what's in between the lines, what's not said. And um, this character, you know, because at that time, and there wasn't a lot of material for young girls. You were either a girlfriend or a really one-dimensional daughter, precocious daughter, your bratty daughter. So because I'm working with a genius, I now know, oh, I can bring something more richer to the equation. Um, so I, I was in a park and again, I start with the idea of look for it, be open to it, ready to um, receive. Um, so I, I was in this park and this girl had this little puppy and she sat down next to me on a bench and she had those bangs, her name was Colleen. And she literally was like, <sighs> Ever, I would say, hi, what's your name? And she was like, Colleen. She just looked like she had a secret everything about her was like she's holding on to this secret. I'm like, what, what's your puppy's name? And she's like, I don't know, I haven't named him yet. And I'm just, I just go, there she is. That one single key to the character was a girl who always has a secret and she's hiding, like peering out of, out of her bangs. So she was like my first <laughs> characterization. I know her, I told her I based that character on her. She, she thinks it's funny. If we could show the second clip, so yeah. the difference for husbands and wives. Um, I love looking at the two scenes back to back because they're, it's your posture, the, the subtlety, it's completely different. And a lot of it, it's very much a Woody Allen character, but then the fire in your eyes in the last part, it's like you as the actress seeped through that scene. How do you balance between collaborating with the director to have his vision, his or her vision, and then at the same time let you come through? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> I love seeing that because that also, it, I'm looking at the opportunities and the difference of what you're given in it just as a, a career path and on jobs. That's the perfect example, no improvisation, that's all Woody Allen writes brilliant language. He, he, it's natural and, it, and that's your job is how to make it seem uh, not written, not memorized. Right. Um, because that was literally pages, uh, or I don't know, a page and a half, you know, and I have all those little sections. So I was, uh, m had it memorized and how to make it just roll off the tongue and the different changes that she's t doing with him and um, that was amazing that he left it on me because uh, uh, you know, we filmed his coverage. It was a two shot and stuff. And I love working with these auteurs. Is it auteurs? Auteurs, not auteurs. Tomato, tomato? Auteur. Auteur, isn't it? Uh, auteur. It, auteur, thanks. 
French, um, that break the rules. Because that's Woody Allen going, oh, I'm going to jump cut. Just because. Because I like it. Uh, and so he just does these, you know, uh, the, he used bits and pieces. We did that. We drove around in New York City and used bits of takes and stuff. And I love looking at that because I'm so not that girl. I did not go to college. I'm not cerebral. I'm not book smart. I'm, I had no, no um, the ability at that time to really analyze, you know, you analysis, articulate. Go on. You didn't write the essay, Oral Sex and Deconstruction, like in the movie, <laughs> yeah. your, your prized essay? Exactly. All those references. So this is me bluffing. You know, I didn't even know Triumph of the Will. I mean, I perused some of the things he he references but i i i was rep i replaced another actress so i just sort of i had to dive in and and one of the staples of of a of an actor or what you do if you got nothing else is commit commit like you know just commit to those words and those actions yeah so there are a lot of students in the audience who are constantly uh, taught that they have to have critiques. They have these uh, scheduled times where they critique each other's script writing or their acting or their filmmaking. And then the other time, at the other hand, um, pe people often tell the students that they should be following their gut and following their instincts. How do you mediate between being open to the feedback so that you can be better and you know knowing when to be like, go away? This yeah. It's such this place of balance because um, uh, what was I say? Critiquing and watching and learning and know of yourself is how you develop, you know, your point of view or your own tastes, even. Um, and you, to understand your strengths and your weaknesses. And on the one hand, you don't want to get too self-conscious or too self-aware because you want to be able to lose all that to create something and not think, because I think art, should, I mean, some artists do create from an intellectual place. I'm not one of them. It's the same with music. I don't write um, from mathematics. Um, but uh, so, uh, let's see, there was a, um, uh, how do you critique yourself? Take it with a grain of salt. I love all those expressions. Um, I don't know, what's the specific... So being open to hearing it but not necessarily absorbing it all? Yeah, it's tricky because you you ha you want to have a sense of confi confidence because who, who's to say this person's more right than that person? So you have to, you really have to go with um, what your gut is telling you and your gut, what can help you there is what do you see that you like in films and why or films, or scripts, or plays, or um, books, and what is your own taste? What are the stories you want to tell? And um, and and sort of just develop a voice. I say do do do. Make mistakes. It's really important just to to do. I've made so many you know bad choices. We're watching some good stuff today. And when I say bad, meaning. Be, there's so many things involved in making movies. It's a collective, so there's so many things I can't control. But even bad choices, you'll see some of them. Natural Born Killers is hilarious. Um, we'll get to that. But you know where I look, and I'm like, ah, I don't know if I would do that the same way. Yeah. You know. So let's watch some of these clips, and we can talk about them. Okay. Natural Born Killers. Yeah, it's they're incredible scenes. The born to be bad scene. Uh, we can obviously we can talk about your music career a little bit later. It's beautiful, but the scene. What is so striking for me is her posture. She's so vulnerable. She seems so vulnerable, and often I, I've, I've read that your characters are often very vulnerable and raw and tough and strong at the same time. And that scene. You see it in her when she's pacing the way she's holding herself, and then she kind of her posture changes as she's burrowing towards the door. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role of your body and your acting? Because you're so physical in a lot of in many of your films. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. It's just uh, 
something I was never again trained otherwise, and I, nor would I have cared for it, you know, to act up here. Because it, oh, I, this comes from the love of people. I love, um, I always was people watching as a kid. I just was, and, um, and how we express emotion physically and how, uh, how we physicalize what we're feeling or trying to hide. So it, that's, that's all, the, you know, it's just so amazing. It's never just about the words. Um, it's, you know, pent up that and then she just turns into a bull. I love that the thing. But um, when I see that, <clears throat> I'm reminded of a few things because that director, Oliver, that's a movie where he wanted all your ideas. There was there was no there were no rules. So when I'm even in the car, that's us shooting in a car with um, screen. We're just stagnant in a car in a soundstage, and he was showing all this um, these images. It was surrealism. It was a mashup of different mediums. So. There is no, all this analysis, that's when you have to learn what situation are you in, when do you shed it, when do you leave it? Because if I was to go, um, why is she singing? It's just written, she's singing a song and then she bangs her head in the door. It's so, I, I can't sit there and ask, well, why is she singing? How long, how many times has she, how long has she been in there? You know, I asked some questions, but at the end of the day, it's irrelevant. It just is what it is. And then even in the, the car scene, and the through line is we just broke out of prison, we're now driving, blah, blah, blah. But it's really about that moment, the expression of so many things. And me going bananas on Woody, I mean, what a nice person that he allowed me to strangle him with my knees. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that was the environment. I was around a group of people that wanted and allowed that. If I felt more restricted, I would have, played a different, I would have sat in my seat and said the lines, but um, I don't know, I just felt like she was, that was my most animalistic performance in the sense she was an amalgamation of many things. That movie's a trip on many levels because to me it's the, uh, br my broadest, um, kind of a real broad, besides comedy, my broadest performance, but it, that's because it, it, um, Oliver Stone was making that kind of movie where it was a, a sort of a send up of of uh, our collective, what we, what the media and and the audiences how they um, create these fantastical is that a word? These fantasy fantastical um, superhero like criminals. Yet, no matter what I do, I try to root it in in true emotion so that the viewer is so that you guys are connecting yeah you can definitely see the combination that you're empathetic or that you there is a, a depth to her character because although there's definitely moments where it's kind of camping over the top i mean with that rear projection you would have to be you couldn't be doing just like subtle facial expressions you probably get missed with everything in the background. Yeah, that was such a physical performance because there was all this noise on screen. So on uh, some hand we were competing with that, but also I'm doing what's true. She's liberated, so I wanted to physicalize that. There's other uh, scenes where it's uh, more quiet and pensive, but Oliver, that, that's one of my favorite teachers because he, I would, I wrote scenes. There's a whole jail scene where I wrote it. I wrote, like, she thinks about, you know what I think about in here? I think about skin on skin and fucking. And, like, I wrote that. But <laughs> not to be like, I wrote that. But uh, <clears throat> I guess I am being that way. But <laughs> my point is, um, well, I guess I'm proud. But also just that that he wanted that. If you didn't, if you weren't living and breathing your character and coming up with ideas, he'd be like, what are you doing? Why are you here? Because yeah. that's the kind of, he would badger you, he'd needle you. So, so we were all required, down, you know, Robert Downey and Harrelson, to really to do our homework. He wanted them to research killers. We went to a prison. He's like, why don't you go talk to him? She's like, really? Go talk to the rapists in the, over there in the corner. I did. I don't know. Um, 
So we're actually skipping 15 years now in your career, because uh, we want to leave room for the students to talk. Uh, to the next scene will be um, the food fight scene in, in Whippet. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, for showing this clip is that a lot of the students in this audience, this is the first film that they would have seen of yours in the theater, and then they explore. Not because there's a whole roller derby contingent yeah. in this there audience? Could, well, there is a roller derby contingent in Toronto. Yes, there is. Definitely. Definitely. So let's see the next clip of Iron Maven. Uh, there's so much we could talk about. We could talk about you working with um, uh, Ellen Page. We could talk about, but I wanted to also just talk a little bit about um, the slapstick comedy kind of aspects. It reminded me of Mixed Nuts when you're uh, nine months pregnant or seven months, it's never clear, and running down chasing your boyfriend in a Santa Claus costume and the kind of absurdist levity Not a lot it. of people make mixed nuts references. I like that. It's a hilarious movie. Thanks. Your, co your, your comedic timing is amazing. Thanks. And so this kind of uh, slapstick room, and that last shot of you laughing hysterically also creates a contrast to Iron Maven just being this bitch who's annihilating the 17-year-old yeah, Derby girl. You know. That was so, you, you'd be surprised of how challenging that was because she's such a, um, first of all, that's Drew Barrymore's directorial debut and I hadn't done movies or any acting for about four and a half years deliberately because I wanted to do everything that a young band would do and that means tour basically relentlessly and find your audience. And so that was my mission because I wanted to, I was starting in a, a whole new career and I wanted to make records. So yeah, I had to give it everything to see if it was gonna pan out. You couldn't half-ass it. So um, so this was my return and, uh, and, and she, uh, oh, Drew was inspired by um, 80s movies, like a lot of John Hughes movies, uh, The Bodyguard, and it's a very archetypal, archetypal, I always say that wrong, like a lot of words. Um, archetypal bad guy, bad guy role in that. Yeah, she's the villain, but so so. But I'm I'm always looking for the contradiction or complexity. But at the same time, she sh should be that. So she should be when she walks in the room. You know, the person you're scared of, but you sort of want to be at the same time. Very much like Matt Dillon in The Bodyguard. He was like that. He was such an asshole. So. This role, but because I have to root it in truth, I was spending time with all these derby girls because I'm the captain of, of my team and the thing. And so we were skating with pro professional derby girls and I was just asked them, would you really like shove a girl in a locker? Do you really tell them they're worthless? Do you really? I'm like, yeah, pretty much. Uh-huh. Not all of them. Yeah. Some people have different sportsmanship, sportswomanship. But um, but it, I likened it to Muhammad Ali, it, you know, and just how you riff, it, you you um, intimidate your opponent. But at the same time, she the, it's also rooted in that this is the young uh, up and comer going to take her place, and there's a lot of jealousy there. Um, so it is really broad, but it's I, I, it's so not who I am. I'm so not a bully. So that's again what was challenging to, to to be that way and to be real and not feel like a cartoon. But a lot of bully people are cartoons. Yeah. They're so yeah, they're goofy. They're caricatures, and there's no real. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're so goofy. If you see like a big guy picking on the nerdy guy, you're just like, really? That's you're gonna commit to that? It's <laughs> so stupid. Yeah. Or um. Don't yeah. be bullies or she'll make fun of you. Yeah, or no, or women like, you know, this stuck up girl and looking down upon the weather way. You're just like, yeah. yeah, I call it Goofy Town. You're going to Goofy Town. So um, we are going to show a clip now from Conviction. Um. Um. Kind of going full circle in the beginning of uh, our conversation, you talked about playing a character that was a real-life character and too young to die. Um, now, you're, again, you're playing a real-life character. And 
how are you going about doing the research for this or just even starting to play? It's such, a, it's such an amazing performance. Thanks. The range in the scene is incredible. Thank you. I, um, when I see that, I just think of all the things that I had to put together to make this cohesive um, somebody and make it feel like nothing, make it feel natural from the accent to the, all the makeup that you, I don't want you to see, but that just becomes me. I also wanted to deaden my eyes. How do you do that? That's an internal spiritual thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I wanted to, those people where you see they're just, they're just living. Cause this woman, first of all, and I had no access to the real person. So it's not about, I studied a person, a character. I put the ingredients together of what I was given through the information and made up this somebody. Um, but it also comes from, again, paying attention in your environment. I've, she's the kind of person that you steer clear of when you're on the street, when you're at the ATM, and they come over. You know what I mean? Those, those toxic souls who are a little bit, they, they follow a logical line and then they skip they, you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, but she's, but the biggest compliment I got was from Betty Ann herself, who was on the set, and said, oh no, you nailed her. You nailed it. And I was like, wow, really? Because I, I didn't uh, 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 meet her, but I, and then I went to a dialect coach. So you do all your training, and at the end of the day, you just jump out of the plane and you let it go. Um, so, this is a metaphor, you get it, right? <laughs> uh, well, because when we went, I had to, I don't want, I don't want to be thinking about my accent, my, that she's an alcoholic, you know, I just want to be it. And it's also those people, she never leaves her house. So if you just took one aspect of that character, a person who never leaves their house and drinks $2 wine for 10 years, how's that person? just even physically, how do they feel, you know what I mean? And so that's what I wanted to get into, that internal uh, aspect of that person, let alone that she's facing the, the girl that she lied and put her brother away for murder. You know, she's lying, but that it also her truth, uh, what I love about this scene, first of all, I took that role, it's two scenes, it was one of the most challenging things I've done in the last 10 years uh, because of the twists and turns of that one scene. But she's a person where everything she's saying is true. In her, she believes everything she's saying. She was manipulated. She did do this. She did lie, but she's not copping to it. She feels fully justified. And at the end of the day, she doesn't sign. So, so even though we feel sympathy for her, she's still so corroded that she cannot stop doing destructive acts. And Betty Ann said she was very much like that. She just could not stop destroying. Um, God, there's so many. I, I don't know if I answered anything, you, but you completely I was answered just giving it. information. I, uh, I want to ask you so many more questions, but I want to make sure they get some too. So we are just going to jump right now to um, the Shit Girls Say clip. <laughs> <laughs> so... Looking at uh, the various versions of Shit Girl Say and then looking at your Funnier Die video when you are the Slovakian correspondent for Scissor Sisters, I think. Oh, and then okay. there's, you know, and then your Gap commercial with Daft um, Punk. And then just like you take all of these opportunities which seem to just be for fun and then for, or for creative um, outlet. Yeah. And so I thought that would be something that we could possibly talk about with the students of just doing it for fun rather than thinking it'll become 8 million hits. Yeah, that's, that's part of the journey. And I think is doing is not having the expectations. And I am into that more now, uh, uh, the experience, the experience rather than the outcome. Um, so, but at the same time, I, I am busy, so you have to decide what you're gonna commit your time to. And that was a no-brainer. I follow Shit Girls Say on Twitter, um, and knew it's, it's topical, it's funny, there's truth in it, and I have no, I can't take any credit for that other than I showed up. That's um, Graydon Shepard who wrote it, I think with his partner Kyle, and 
he's just funny. I'm just, I lucked out because I actually didn't know he was as talented as he is just visually in the editing, the whole thing about it looks really good. And he's a video director and a filmmaker. And, um, and I want to continue taking the risks or whatever, but meaning working with people who are just doing new things. And I, especially today, there's so much in, in these various mediums and um, with the internet, you can really take your own creative journey in your hands more so, even though we all dream of the glory and the, but I've done, I've worked on many first time filmmakers jobs, uh, movies, and they don't get released. I mean, there's so much politics in big business. So there's a lot of freedom, even though, even as an independent, I understand it more as an independent musician in that I don't have a major label, never have, wished I had those resources, you know, because I want, there's a certain th ambitions and dreams I have in my live show that I can't afford. Uh, I don't even have a lighting guy. You know, I was happy when I had a sound guy, sign, a sound guy or gal. So that's what I'm saying is more and more, it's like what you're willing to give and dream and you, you bring a collective, a, a, a group together and you make it happen. We have one final clip, and it is of your new TV series, The Firm. So we'll show that. Thank you. Yeah. I just uh, could you talk a little bit about taking this series and how it's completely different from you just did a tour with live audiences all the yeah. time and and now the TV series, and then if you have time still for music. You know, I often do things that I'm terrified of, um, and I jokingly refer to this as having a masochistic streak. Um, <laughs> you know, like I took a Sam Shepard play in London five years ago, because I wanted the experience of doing the same thing, even though I know I don't want to play the same part over and over for months, but I exactly why I don't want to is why I wanted to do it to see if I could and to see what it would strengthen in me. Um, and it was incredibly challenging and emotional, that play. So this was the fear of commitment, this kind of commitment, and also all the variables that are out of my control like not knowing what the script is going to be from week to week. That's frightening. And so, so in the beginning, I took, uh, I made the decision off the strength of the first script. It was riveting. It was a two-hour pilot. Um, it's based on Grish John Grisham characters, but it's not a, a tight, suspenseful Grisham novel because it's, a, it's serious television. So there is a certain formula to it. Um, Mitch, uh, played by Josh Lucas, is a lawyer, so there's procedural uh, uh, cases each episode, and then also there's this thriller element that uh, references a lot of the book that's going to go on for 22 episodes. So to make the decision, I, I uh, talked a lot with the show creator, but I knew it was, was going to be a big risk because I don't know how it's going to pan out. So I'm mid-stride right now. I'm in the middle of that journey. I'm in love with my cast. Um, Callum Keith Rennie, Molly Parker, who I've been fans separately of for years, and Josh Lucas. So that has also helped me make the decision because I feel like cast is everything and how we interpret this kind of material. Um, so it's interesting, and I, I very much wanted to be a part of an ensemble because I thought I could make music in the interim. Um, but right now, I'm, it's being—it's really challenging to find balance, and I miss touring so much. And, and I'll get to it, I think, in a few months when we're done. So let's open up the conversation and the questions from the audience. If we could um, have microphones. Any questions? Yeah, right there. Um, you said that a lot of, oh. 
You said that a lot of um, directors acted as teachers to you, and I was wondering if there is any um, actors that also are teachers to you, and if there's anyone that stands out specifically. Absolutely. And when I say they were teachers, I don't know that they knew they were in that role. I just looked at um, what I could, what I learned incidentally from the experience. Um, I hold Robert De Niro in the highest regard, and he's the end all be all to me, I, in the sense that he taught me about professionalism. Um, I think I was, uh, yeah, I was 18 when I did Cape Fear, and so when you're younger, you're so, you know, you're so into your building your own legend. I think we all have a little bit of it, but y y if you know what I mean, like, like, um, cause you hear all the stories that came before. So you hear all these urban legends, um, of like, yeah, do you know what he did or she did to prepare for that role? And, and you're sort of into all that stuff of it rather than d delivering all that once it's go time, once it says action. So that's what I'm about now. It's like, put it on when you say action to live to me, t t uh, living a healthy, um, life or constructive life that that to me benefits that what you can give on on uh, camera or in your writing or whatever you do. So here's De Niro taught me about professionalism in that show up on time, always be prepared, um, be gracious. He's a man of few words. He doesn't talk a lot. It's not it's just because it's not one of his things. He's very focused and concentrated, um, but. And it was such an opposite of what I thought, because you hear a lot, of, a lot of young actors hear about, there's that great story, uh, Dustin Hoffman showing up, what, working with Laurence Olivier, and who knows the real story, but the urban legend goes, he was you know, drinking all night, he hadn't slept for days, he comes in, and he's like, and, and he, Laurence Olivier is like, you look like a wreck. And he goes, oh yeah, because his character was supposed to have gone through all that. And so then he did, you know, method acting or whatever that is. And then uh, Lawrence Olivier was like, why don't you try acting, my dear boy? You know this story? <laughs> so there's that concept. Once I knew that De Niro, I don't know about his process. I didn't know he's sitting with a gospel singer in his trailer speaking in tongues or what he's doing on the side. I only knew what I saw on, on set, which was a very focused prepared actor. And so now when I work with other people and they're misbehaving or they're they're dramatizing and, and creating, you know, problems, it's like that's not that's not how it's done and it's unnecessary, actually. And it makes it unpleasant. Um sorry. Uh I want to be a producer and I was just wondering um when you're looking for a role, does the producer really matter or is it the role that you're looking at more and, and what do you look at in that person that's gonna kind of take the series or the, the movie to the next level? Does that really matter, like a big deal when you're looking for it? Absolutely. Produ I, that's one of the things I do to make a decision is I wanna know uh, the producer on the project because sometimes you can have a director who has all these great ideas but the producer is the one who helps facilitate and, and help the director um, uh, do all that and navigate because there's so many decisions. The director has to be able to say his, his, his or her vision to the set designer, the wardrobe person, the actors. There's so much to manage, so a producer helps I think there's all different kinds of producers, but they also help uh, bridge the business uh, element and those conversations with the artist and keep keep w the things off the artist's plate that they don't need to be worrying about. Um, so and also talk and handhold. You know, if a, a director is not making their days, you know, they're behind schedule. You have to sort of be the motivator. And with actors too, produ producers often have the conversations. If an actor is struggling with something, you sort of help, how can we make this work and make this better? So there's a lot of diplomacy that a producer has to have. Um, but I must say it's producers and filmmakers that gave me my career. Because if the studio conglomerate entities, whatever they are, that, 
I, I, I don't speak that nicely about the big business, but it has to exist. But because they, they they like boxes, they like familiar, they like sure things. So if they see something new and fresh, well, except for there's always exceptions. Some people are looking for the new fresh thing, and other people are like, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, that's that's weird. I don't understand that. Give me something I've give me something tried and true." Um, so it's producers, creative-minded producers and filmmakers who helped um, and supported my g giving me roles. This one over here. Um, I'm curious about your Gap commercial with Daft Punk and how it compares to you being in um, in acting in films or other mediums. And it just seemed like a very fun, spontaneous commercial, but at the same time, it was very technically polished. And were you clowning around? Was it very specifically choreographed? And would you, you know, do you prefer doing that to uh, maybe doing movies or so forth? I'm just worried about. The, I'm concerned about the process. Yeah, it's interesting because you get all these opportunities. It, you, it was such a trip, too, when I first started music because there I'm like trying to preserve what credibility I have and you have all kinds of people like, oh, you want to sing? Hey, can you host our karaoke game uh, party for $50,000? It's big money, but I, I keep, that's where you sell your soul to the devil. It's like if I start doing that no i got offered that and thank goodness i have a manager that protects and understands what i want creatively because other people just see dollar signs and be like they just run toward it uh, um uh so the gap commercial these are us this was interesting they usually tell me the idea and i'm like oh yeah that fits me and i can support this brand because I'm not, you know, I didn't get into what I'm doing to to sell perfume. I don't want to sell perfume. <laughs> we cut to five years later, like, hey. <laughs> I think I can say now I'm not going to sell perfume. However, when I got into music, I became a t-shirt seller, you know, because we now know music you know, you're making music to actually how I was started seeing it because I came into music late is to to support your live show. Thank God, to, to me, the live show arena is the last untouchable medium. And um, so everything was geared towards supporting that. My point is I digress, but being a musician, I had to sell T-shirts and CDs at, at every show. That's what kept us on the road. Um, so with Gap, we, we all go to the Gap, I mean, every once in a while, and, uh, and Daft Punk, I love Daft Punk, I had their record, so I loved this union, uh, the whole dance thing was choreographed, and um, I just committed, and it worked out. But, I'm but if I hadn't liked it, if they had me doing some gyrating weird thing, I would s <laughs> have said something. I would have said, no, I'm not gonna move like that but I was okay with their little dance moves. <laughs> so I'm getting cues that we have time for one more. Yep. Um, hi. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say welcome to Toronto. It's great to have you here. Thanks. And um, in Natural Born Killers, one of my favorite scenes actually is um, what you just said you wrote. So that's amazing to me that you wrote that. One of the things that fascinated me about that scene as an actor um, the way it was cut between you saying the same line in like three completely different ways. And I was wondering when you were shooting that, did you, did you go in with um, a certain, like, did you have a certain way you were planning on doing it and it just came out and you just did take after take after take? And do you do that often? Like just go to, a, to the complete other side of the spectrum? Yeah, it is my style that, um, first of all, we can ask a few more questions because I, I, I'm just saying, unless you have to go, because I know I kept this short, it's just, I don't have to, I'm not work, it's a different kind of work, a wardrobe fitting and a table reading, okay, whatever. Um, so, um, wait, what was that? Oh, so this is naturally, because of something in my blood and I'm very much, from my parents, because they're both extremely individual and funny and pro-art, they've nurtured this. I And I also moved around a lot of kids. I, I don't know if this, it's probably not the reason, but 
I am drawn to, I don't like repetition too much, but it's exactly why, like touring, that's the hardest thing, because you are doing constant repetition. So this challenge of how to make something live and breathe in each moment in a new way and, and have it be like the first time. So that's always what I'm striving for. So in, in acting, because the medium of film, I did it this way, okay, you got it. They, they have it, so, so I, now I try it a different way. It's just the way I am and I always think, I mean, it leaves you open to they can edit together your worst takes and you could have maybe not the greatest performance, but I always just try to do something fresh and it's what directors and my favorite directors, they've responded to in me. Um, again, these are things I learned, like uh, Scorsese validated that in me uh, uh, to, to never do the same take twice, but it's just naturally what I was geared toward. And in um, Natural Born Killers, you just reminded me of, uh, oh, because you said before about actors. Um, I forgot, oh well. Oh, darn it, but um, you're making me think of something did I know? I didn't know uh, that that movie would be what it was. I just knew to just show up and be ready for the experience and to, to just commit and bring and just dump out all my ideas for better or for worse. Over here. Over Hi. here. Um, oh. Oh. <laughs> did you want to go first? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first and then Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. okay. I was wondering if you could give advice to the young actor that's just starting out and you know they're paying for training and they're paying for bills but these auditions are coming up and I wanted to know like how do you make that decision of whether or not to miss that audition or to t continue to go to work? That's on you, babe. No. Well, yeah. This no, but I know, I know what you're but, saying. You know yes, I mean? when to, this is what I've, this is, I just went through this. I mean, st uh, when I started a new career at 30, you know, the first, the further, I, I was cutting the umbilical cord to all that I knew. The only job I'd known since I was 13. And, and, and by doing that, I could potentially lose or something, you know. Anyway, it had a lot of, fear, but I had to do it. So with a regular job and also trying to cultivate an acting career, at some point you'll have to make the decision if you want to give everything to it right. um, and go for broke. That's the thing, this, is this idea. But, you know, there's also to be practical, put a little money in the bank and also s and, and develop. So for new actors, I always encourage, I think classes are great, doing plays, as much as it seems it, it, you can do different characters and um, carving out a little niche, understanding your own process a little more and then also um, a lot of the technical stuff that you don't learn until you get there, you know, the relationship to the camera and the focus puller, the wardrobe, all the different departments because that's not a theater medium and those things, that, that's why I liked, I started in TV, whether you do these, and never knock it, you know, these little bit parts here and there. I mean, we're all dreaming towards that really rich creative experience, but I'll tell you, in my 20 year career, those are just the little nuggets that, that keep you going. The rest is sometimes I don't know if this is the right word, but utilitarian. You know, you're serving the story or sometimes you're selling cereal. Um, you know what I mean? So you have to find something within it. And it really is at the end of the day that it is a, a, a really different, strange, frustrating and colorful line of work and business. And I, I actually love the people in it. I love the crews. I love the blend of different personalities that come to this business. You know, I wouldn't, I don't know what else I would do. I, I always joke that I wouldn't, I'm not good at filing <laughs> or accounting. Over here. In the front, yeah. Hi, over here. <laughs> um, so just to follow up on Candace's question earlier um, about producers and whatnot, um, 
When you're working with directors and producers and other any filmmaker really, what do you think as an actress is the most um, helpful thing a director can do kind of to get the best performance out of you? And uh, same thing with producers or anyone else really. Um, there's two parts. There's one, understanding your text. It's the first thing I do when you have material um, if you have a written story, there's other wild creative processes where like, hey, we have these characters and then we're gonna create a story all together. That's a whole different, that's a Cassavetes approach. I'm actually gonna be doing a movie like that where we workshop the ideas and the material and then the director develops it. But first I always sit down, I think it's really important to understand the text and the story and the characters and to just see if you're on the same page. So that's the simple discussion of, I was sort of seeing that my character was like this. She gets angry a lot, or she's frustrated with her father, or blah, 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 or whatever the story is. And, if, and to see if you're in sync, hopefully you sort of hash that out before you have the job. That's sort of what I usually do in meetings. We sort of hash out our ideas. But sometimes you learn it when you work together and you go, oh, actually, I was thinking she hides all that anger and she has a very calm demeanor and she's conservative and blah, blah, blah. So you get, that's the, the creative part and what she looks like, what she wears. Um, we, the director oversees everything from, it's sort of his or her final say, because even when I, I have opinions on my wardrobe, you know, she always wears skirts. She never wears pants. Maybe that's a creative decision. The director will go, eh, I like that idea, except for that one scene where she rides a horse. I want her wearing pants. Whatever. So you guys sort of, you have these compromises and stuff. Um, the, the one thing, like Gary Marshall, we didn't show this movie, but the other sister was one of the most challenging roles I'd ever played. It didn't do well in the theaters. Um, I play a mentally handicapped young girl who's searching for her independence and to lead the life of any uh, normal person against the odds. And it had so much heart and determination. Um, it's really special to me, but I, I, did, I, ha I got hired off of a, an audition I did where at the minimally, all I did was read the lines very naturally. And, and I believed in them. Because the character had a very, she had a naivete, but I didn't know how I would talk yet. I didn't know what she, how she was physically. I just, so I got it, the audition, I got the part just off of the reading of the lines. When I got the job, I was terrified. I had no idea, I didn't want to fall on my face. You know these are the roles you could do the worst at. There's all these cliches. Um, playing a mentally challenged uh, person. And so what Gary Marshall did is he he never made me feel that he didn't have faith in me. He was like, uh, how's it going? You know, he would set up, he would help set up, uh, I met with different people. He would He would facilitate my research, basically, or give me ideas. He'd say, oh, because the producer's sister was, uh, m mentally challenged, so he's, he helped with the producer uh, get me footage to see, so you can help the person, whatever they need that they feel they're gonna be able to do their job better is what a producer and director help facilitate. But that was such a huge thing is Gary, whether he was scared I was gonna pull it off or not, he never let me know that. And then day one, once I arrived, I, I was ready, because I had found her voice and that was so key. Um, so I don't know if that helps a little bit, but just, you just had a faith, and and you, you to be a leader, it's so important to keep a cool head, um, and, and you know, because actors are so internal and they go through so much you, sometimes of figuring things out. It, 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 to instill confidence in, in somebody is a really a testament of a great, uh, leader. Um, I've just been told this yeah. is the final question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I used to have a big crush on you from the movie What's Eating Gilbert Grape. 
And I just wanted to ask you about, like, you were kind of a straight character in that, which was is different from a lot of the stuff you usually do, you know? There's a lot of kind of crazy characters around you. And do you find that harder, or is there other stuff that you have to bring to it when you're just kind of a straight kind of core? No, they're all equally as challenging. Oh, first of all, thank you for your crush. It stands to this day. <laughs> He's like, what are you doing later? Um, um, no, it's funny because you'd think um, playing crazy is liberating. It's not. It's so challenging. Because I'm always striving to have something be real, have it be really real and, and complicated and full of layers as people are. So um, what's eating Gilbert Grape there's also her, the person's place in the story, and you're exactly right. She's sort of the sanity in that element. She's the level-headed uh, serenity a little bit. She's kind of zen. But at the same time, she has her own journey. They're in the middle of nowhere. She's stuck with her grandmother and all these things. So I, I'm always searching. I don't want to get too metaphysical, but I get really into energy, the energy of, of a character or a person, the, like their frequencies. This is where I can equate it to music, because there's like, you could literally hang out with somebody and they have certain, this is what we call a vibe. You know, you can have somebody like, wow, what a fucking vibe killer that person is. <laughs> or, <laughs> or good vibes. That was a good vibes. So, um, <laughs> but, but the point is like the, the, the polar opposite of the Gilbert Grape character, which is the conviction, that's like this jagged frequency. There's like electrical, she's just shooting off, you know, if you could see her energy, it'd be so toxic and like a little storm cloud. Um, and then, uh, uh, Gilbert Grape, there's just this like serenity. I don't know. I could, that's why I listen to music a lot, preparing. I sort of listen to music that I feel is the, the center of that character and, and makes me feel what that person feels like. And that's a real good shortcut for acting. You can just sort of get into the zone of your person. And like Cape Fear, I was listening to all this 50s heart-wrenching um, love, lorn uh, uh, music because that's where she's living, you know, just super melodramatic, all this 50s, like the Chantelles, everything's about, it's just a saga of love. And then Natural Born Killer is one of my favorite, uh, getting in the zone with that was, um, getting in the zone, I've like never used that phrase, but <laughs> for the character, I got in the zone. Um, <laughs> but it was Jimi Hendrix Voodoo Child, Slight Return, and if you listen to that whole song, his guitar, I always visualize music too, but it's like, and then it like, and it's like, but there's all these drums that come in and literally his guitar is walking me through the jungle of despair and chaos and darkness and there's a brutality in it. And, um, and to me, that's the entire journey of Mallory Knox was was Jimi Hendrix. It was that song, and I used to listen to Killing Floor. I should quit you. It was like really fast and furious. Uh, so uh, yeah, there's different music's good for that connection. Thank you so much for okay. coming today. Thank you to everyone here for supporting Higher Learning. Um, I wanted to say I like to leave sometimes these classes really quickly uh, um, with this idea because I think as artists and creative people, we're up against what's in our culture right now that's just, we're inundated with this consumerism and the branding and this, this all this superficial ugliness. Um, particularly in America, you guys at least cultivate the arts a little bit more, like with your um, financially from the government. So th that's very promising. Um, <laughs> like TIFF. Um, but it, I think it's so important to not get beat down 
by all that we see in mainstream media and just know that that's not, that's, this is what's real. This is what exists, you know? And I, I really, there's a positive to social networking because you can pair up with like-minded people or open your mind to other uh, writers and progressive thinkers and funny people that you weren't aware of before. So I think that's an important avenue. And it's just, it's, it's also, it's just important that people cultivate their own uh, point of view and voice and um, just not get beat down for this thing that's really popular in the culture, which is attention for attention's sake. You know, it's just like, what, what kind of attention do you want? And actually to not get stuck on that, but to, to, to really value and enjoy the experience and the journey and, and, and it with other human beings. Because the, the, the industry I'm in, it is, it's, it's um, it, that we're in is, can be frustrating and disenchanting and heartbreaking, and that, but it can also be really magical and incredible and dangerous and exciting. So, so I try to acknowledge that and, and, and um, not get steered away from just those, those, those priorities. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks for having me.